Hello, it's Gary Fox here, and uh, tonight we're going to talk about circles and cycles. Cycles and circles. That almost rhymes. And um, I want to talk about where cycles come from. There's two ways of generating them that I know of. And uh, so we'll just start. Okay. Start with a circle. Now a circle is a uh, continuous loop. And much of nature works off of circles. Man, as man thinks about things, man thinks about I want to get from point A to point B. And the closest distance between two points is a line. But much of what nature has continues the same thing over and over and over again. So we think about, you know, daylight turns to night, night comes to day, uh, the moon rotates around the earth, revolves around the earth, and as it does, it creates the different moon cycles that we see. Um, we have the seasons, the seasons change based upon how the earth rotates around the sun and then the angle of inclination of the of the earth. So much of nature is cycles. Water, there's the water cycle. There, there is the, uh, I think it's the oxygen cycle. Uh, there's cycles in just about everything. So we start with the circle and then to make it easy for me to, to do this, I do some angle lines on there. Each of these angles is at 10 degrees from the previous one and we're going to start from what's commonly called the zero point which is right here at the uh, three o'clock position and we're going to go in a counterclockwise direction and that's done because when people drew regular graphs they made this first quadrant here as zero as the uh, first quadrant and then numbers went up as they went and numbers increased as they went to the left and numbers increased as they went upward. So they did the same thing with the circle. They start right here as the zero degree point and then here be 90, 180, 270, and back to zero. Okay, what we're going to do with those is that we're going to draw lines. We're going to extend these and we're going to extend based upon the uh, point where the radial line intersects the circumference of the circle, the outer edge of the circle. So I'm going to turn those on right now. And we have those in the horizontal direction. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so we can see the whole thing. And now we're going to draw those in a regular graph form. So I need myself some uh, some lines here, some grid lines, and each of these are going to represent 10 degrees. And so now we draw how far up it is. So here at the first point, we'd be right at 0, 0. Second point, we'd move over 10 degrees, and then we move to the point where it, it lines up. So we'll do that here, and I have now drawn that graph. You see that I did the first half as it was getting going up, and then the second part of it is exactly just a mirror image of that as it goes down. Well, if we continued on around the circle, now we've made it 180 degrees, so now let's say we continue on around and we do the second half. All I have to do is take this, mirror it, make a mirror of it around this zero line down here and then move it back over to show the uh, second half and that's exactly how I drew that. And now let's zoom out just a little bit more. Actually, let's cursor over. Whoa! I blew it. Okay, well there it is right there. So we zoomed out and we now have that shape which almost everybody knows is called a sine wave. And that's exactly how it's created in electricity. They have a magnet inside a, a wheel, 
inside a uh, circular thing and they have coils out here and as that magnet moves by those coils it would generate if it was exactly if this coil was on the top it would generate maximum amount of power as it crossed that top and it would z generate zero power as it was at the 90 degree point uh, sorry the zero and the 180 degree points and then it would be affecting the opposite half of that coil as it went around to the uh, the second half of the curve and so it generates it exactly like that so that's one of the ways which an actual sine wave is generated and you think about this this dynamo of industry this generator would be rotating at constant speed so this would be constant time right here instead of just constant degrees but it's constant degrees also as it continued around and did the second half, you can imagine we'd keep sticking these sine waves, sticking them to each other, and the sine wave would continue to grow and grow and grow, would never end. There is no alpha or no omega, because uh, it begins and it keeps right on going. So... That is that part of the circle. Well, now, what would happen if we were looking at how far over it moved. This is how far up and down it moves. So let's go ahead. We'll draw some extension lines in the, in the downward direction. I'll have to zoom out again. And we'll draw some grid lines so that we can graph it just like we did our other one. But we're doing it sideways. So we'll draw some grid lines here. We have our grid lines. And now we start plotting from this point, and we plot all the way around through halfway around the, uh, the circle. So as we do that, we end up with this right here. Okay, let's turn off some of these extension lines so we can see it a little bit better. So I'll turn off the uh, horizontal extension lines and the vertical extension lines. And we'll see that we have this kind of funny shaped curve right here. Well, let's continue it on around the second half. And I do that by mirroring the image and then uh, adding it to it. So we'll do the cosine second half. We'll zoom in on the thing. Or zoom out, I mean. And now you see that we have the second half of this waveform. Well, let's put it in relationship with this, this sine wave. So I will move it over, and then I'll turn off the one we had to begin with, if I find the uh, thing right here. And so now we've kind of got a little bit prettier picture here. Okay, there's some other things that we can point out about this. If we look at this curve right here, at how fast it's moving. It's moving at maximum speed at this part and then it starts to slow down. Then it starts going in the negative direction and then it goes maximum speed here in a negative direction and then it changes and goes into uh, starts climbing again but it's going very slow and then it starts climbing until it gets to maximum speed in the positive direction. So, let's see, let's put some 90 degree lines in here so we can compare these two. So, if you see that, it turns out that this is showing it at maximum speed. And then it starts slowing down. And then it starts going in the opposite direction. Very slow and then, or, sorry, very quickly. No, very slow. And then it speeds up to right here. It's going maximum speed in the negative direction. And then it slows down, and then it starts going in the positive direction. So another way of looking at the cosine wave, and that's what this one's called. Remember, it was made from how far it moves over, left and right. Another way of looking at the cosine wave is the cosine wave is the uh, amount of rate of change of the sine wave. So they're 90 degrees from each other. And that has a whole lot to do with a lot of things. 
you think about, remember the rubber band and the hammer in my previous video. And let's say that we have the uh, rubber band is stretched at the max. Well, the hammer is moving at fastest speed. I'm sorry, the hammer is not moving at that point. But then as the hammer starts moving and gets to the fastest speed, the rubber band eventually is at zero stretch. Then the rubber band goes to the point where it's uh, stretched even less. Uh, less than what it would take to just hold the hammer with the hammer moving still. And the hammer starts slowing down because gravity's pulling it. Then the hammer starts picking up speed in the opposite direction because gravity's pulling it down and it starts stretching the rubber band in the opposite direction. So the rubber band and the hammer were 180 degrees. I'm sorry, 90 degrees from each other, the speed of the hammer and the amount of stretch on the rubber band. And it forms the, this waveforms, which the big name for that is simple harmonic motion. And is based upon a circle. So it's a cycle as if it was going around a circle. The same kind of formula happens in predator prey situations where let's say you have foxes and rabbits. That's the typical one they give you uh, when they talk about this. So we have fox population at minimum but the rabbits are at maximum. Well the foxes have plenty to eat so they start producing more foxes. Pretty soon the rabbit population gets going down. Well then the foxes have reached a peak but there's still a lot of them. So they keep eating rabbits, what few rabbits they can find. And then the rabbit population declines to its minimum. The fox population's falling off because they're getting hungry and starving to death. And then as the rabbit population starts to grow, the fox population is still dying off. Until it gets to the point where the fox population is at the lowest. And the rabbit population is still growing, so now the foxes can even grow and multiply. And the cycle starts all over again. So you end up with this, this waveform. If you think about much of what's going on in nature, there's these uh, waveforms that happen because of uh, El Nino and those growths of uh, bacteria in the, way, in the ocean. And they all continue based upon cycles. And I find that, I guess, very interesting. But I also find it kind of uh, amazing that the world works on those kind of cycles. Anyhow, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of math, not much math this time, and even a little bit about technology. But I kind of wanted you to start thinking about circles. And if you want to know more about this, you can find out about uh, trigonometry and about sine waves, cosine waves. And now I'd make it worth sitting through those math classes, listening to the guy talk about these things. Um, unfortunately, they usually teach math first. And you don't know a real reason for the math until later on. So I'm trying to bring up the reasons for it first so that you'll go through the math to try to understand it. There's going to be a future video. The future one's going to talk about three phases. And uh, it's going to be a little bit shorter. Uh, that video talk about how the three phases get balanced out with each other. Appreciate you listening. Hopefully you got something out of this. This is Gary Fox. Thank you.